The next step in our overview of the RHPA is to gain a basic understanding of the key regulatory processes in the statute. With these processes in mind, some of the concept we've previously considered will begin to fall into place and make sense. These processes, for the most part, are related to a specific statutory committee of a college, which generally undertakes the oversight of much of the activity associated with the process. Let's run through some of the most important college processes and the associated committees. Organizational direction is associated with the council and the executive committee. Registration is associated with the registration committee. Complaints and reports are associated with the inquiries, complaints, and reports committee. Discipline is associated with the discipline committee. Incapacity is associated with the fitness to practice committee. Quality assurance is associated with the quality assurance committee. And patient relations is associated with the patient relations committee. Setting organizational direction for college activities is the duty of the college's council. Council meetings are required to be open to the public except for limited circumstances such as when council is discussing public security matters, taking legal advice, or discussing personnel matters. Essentially, council's duty is to make decisions that set the college's direction and provide oversight. This includes things like strategic planning, mission and vision setting, as well as decisions on college rules such as regulations, bylaws, standards, and other official documents or positions. Because councils typically only meet three or four times each year, and issues may arise in the interim that require direction, the RHPA also establishes an executive committee that has the authority to exercise many of the council's powers between council meetings. The executive committee cannot make decisions respecting regulations or bylaws. The executive committee is required to report on any decision it makes at the next council meeting. This helps to maintain transparency. The Registration Committee is responsible for college registration processes. Each college establishes regulations that set out the requirements applicants must meet in order to get registered. If an applicant meets the requirements, the registrar generally issues a certificate of registration. If there is any doubt as to whether the applicant qualifies, they are sent to the Registration Committee for consideration. The committee has a number of options including issuing the certificate, issuing it with conditions, or refusing the application. If the committee does anything other than issue the certificate, the applicant must be notified of their right to appeal the matter to the Health Profession's Appeal and Review Board. When reviewing the matter, the board has essentially the same decision-making authority as the committee to direct the issuing of a certificate of registration. The board can also confirm the original decision, refer the matter back to the committee, direct that the applicant be granted a certificate without conditions and terms, or that the applicant take additional training or examinations. While not directly part of the role of registration committees, sections 22.1 to 22.14 of the code are important recent additional requirements related to registration. These sections define the role of colleges and the Fairness Commission to ensure that college registration practices are transparent, objective, impartial, and fair. For colleges, these obligations include providing information on its registration requirements and ensuring its staff are trained to make objective decisions. Colleges are also obliged to periodically conduct audits of their registration practices to ensure that they are fair. Inquiries, Complaints and Reports Committees are responsible for the processes relating to complaints or reports made about college members. While the requirements of the process are detailed, some of the key steps in it include informing the member that a complaint has been made and permitting the member to make submissions on the matter, investigating the complaint or considering the report. The code also includes a detailed process outlining how investigators are appointed and giving them the required authority to undertake investigations, considering prior decisions of the college that relate to the member making decisions on the matter within its own authority, which include referring the matter to discipline, referring for incapacity concerns, and cautioning the member. If the matter hasn't been referred to discipline and it's not a sexual abuse case, the registrar may also refer it for alternative dispute resolution if both the complainant and their member agree. After a decision has been made on a report, members must be provided with decisions and reasons. In complaints cases, both the member and the complainant are entitled to decisions and reasons. Members and complainants must also be notified of their right to have the decision considered by HPARB. It's important to note that the committee cannot refer members to the Quality Assurance Committee, although it can require members to complete continuing education or remediation programs. 
The code imposes strict time limits of 150 days for the disposition of complaints, and it also defines the processes that must be followed when there are delays beyond this time frame. Members or complainants may ask that the matter be reviewed by HPARB if they have concerns about process delays. If the board does review a matter, it has essentially all the powers of the college to review the matter. After considering the matter, it can refer it back to committee, make recommendations to the committee, or require the committee to do anything within its authority to do. Discipline committees are charged with considering referrals from the Investigations, Complaints and Reports Committee for allegations of professional misconduct or incompetence. As with the ICRC process, the specific requirements for holding discipline hearings is quite detailed. There are some key aspects that should be kept in mind. The discipline committee may act to impose in term suspensions or terms, conditions and limitations on a member's certificate if the committee believes that the member's continued activity may expose patients to harm. The college and the member who are subject to the allegations are automatically parties to the hearing. Others who wish to be parties to the hearing have to apply, and the panel may allow them to participate if the good character, proper conduct, or competence of the person is an issue, and the person's assistance would be helpful to the panel. Evidence against the member must be disclosed to the member in advance of the hearing. Hearings of the discipline panel are open to the public except in very strictly defined circumstances. In some circumstances, panels may decide to issue publication bans on all information disclosed in hearings. These reasons include public security, where financial or personal information may be disclosed, for safety reasons, or where the proceedings may be prejudiced. In sexual abuse cases, panels shall prohibit the identification of witnesses when the witnesses have requested that their identity not be disclosed. If a member is found guilty of professional misconduct, the panel may apply any of a range of penalties, including revocation, suspension, terms, conditions and limitations, reprimands or fines. If the professional misconduct relates to defined types of sexual abuse, panels are required to apply the mandatory penalties of reprimand and revocation in addition to any other orders. If a member is found guilty of incompetence, then the panel may revoke, suspend or apply terms, conditions and limitations to the member's certificate of registration. After a panel makes its decision, the panel must provide reasons and decisions to the parties and publish the decision or a summary of it in the college's annual report as well as post the decision on the college's website. There is no internal college or RHPA appeal process for discipline decisions. Appeals of these decisions must be made through the Ontario court system. The RHPA's incapacity provisions deal with members whose professional abilities may be impaired through physical or mental illness or from substance abuse. The process for dealing with concerns about a member's incapacity is somewhat confusing because different aspects of the process are managed by a number of agents, including the Registrar, the Inquiries, Complaints and Reports Committee, and the Fitness to Practice Committee. The process basically follows three steps. Step one. If the registrar believes that a member is incapacitated, they can make inquiries and report these to the Inquiries, Complaints and Reports Committee. Step 2. The ICRC may then appoint a panel to inquire into whether the member is in fact incapacitated. If the inquiry results in the panel having reasonable grounds to believe that the member is incapacitated, the member may be required to submit to physical or mental examination. Both the member and the panel receive a copy of the report. After considering the report, the panel may refer the member to the Fitness to Practice Committee for a proceeding. Step 3. Once the member has been referred to the Fitness to Practice Committee, the process becomes similar to a referral to the Discipline Committee. There is one key difference. Fitness to Practice hearings are not open to the public except upon request by the member. If the member is found by the Fitness Practice Committee to be incapacitated, the panel may revoke, suspend, or apply terms, conditions, and limitations to the member's certificate of practice. As with discipline matters, there is no internal college or RHPA appeal process for fitness to practice matters. Appeals must be made through the Ontario court system. And now to the Quality Assurance Committee. This committee is responsible for college quality assurance processes. College quality assurance programs refer to the programs colleges have implemented to systematically measure and validate the appropriateness and effectiveness of the care their members provide. 
The code directs colleges to make regulations that prescribe a quality assurance program and sets out the minimum requirements for such a program, including continuing education, professional development, self, peer and practice assessment, and a tool to assess member compliance with the quality assurance program. Members who are assessed through the quality assurance process and deemed to be unsuccessful can be considered by the quality assurance committee. It has a number of resolutions available to it. These include requiring members to participate in remediation or continuing education, applying terms, conditions and limitation to member certificates, disclosing the names of a member and the allegations about the member to the ICRC in circumstances where the committee is of the opinion that the member may have committed professional misconduct, be incompetent, or be incapacitated. An important principle in the Quality Assurance Program is that information collected through it is confidential and cannot be shared with other college program areas. The only exception to this rule is the authority to provide the member's name and allegations if the member is believed to have committed professional misconduct, to be incompetent, or to be incapacitated. The Quality Assurance Committee may also be informed if the member provided false information to the committee or to an assessor. The final key regulatory process is the Patient Relations Program. All colleges must have a Patient Relations Program, and the program must include measures for preventing and dealing with sexual abuse of patients. Sexual abuse measures need to include educational requirements for members, guidelines for the conduct of members with their patients, training for college staff, and the provision of information to the public. While the code does not specifically require patient relations committees to manage patient relations programs, in many colleges, the patient relations committee has been assigned this role, and they work to make sure that colleges meet their obligations for patient relations programs. The statutory role of the Patient Relations Committee is quite limited. Its sole legal obligation is to administer college programs to provide funding for therapy and counselling for people who were sexually abused by members. However, Patient Relations Committee do not always restrict their activities to these two roles. Some colleges are now moving towards the development of programs to educate patients on how to exercise their rights under the RHPA, and Patient Relations Committee are often taking a lead in such activities. Let's do a quick review. True or false, a key role for both colleges' councils and executive committees is to make organizational direction decisions for colleges. The answer is true. The duty of the council is to make decisions that guide college activities, and executive committees have the authority to exercise many of council's powers between meetings. Which of the following is not a statutory committee of colleges? The Registration Committee. The Patient Relations Committee the Finance Committee, the Discipline Committee, the Fitness to Practice Committee. The answer is the third one, Finance Committees. While they are often established by colleges to provide their councils with advice and oversight on financial matters, they are not statutory committees as they are not required by the RHPA. And this brings us to the end of understanding the Regulated Health Professions Act. Before we wrap up, I'd like to highlight some of the key things you should remember about the RHPA model. The RHPA model shares the responsibility for professional regulation between the profession and the public. It's a certification and title protection model of professional regulation that uses overlapping scopes of practice and recognizes practicing a health profession as a privilege. It also has a strong public protection focus. The RHPA model is made up of the RHPA and regulations, the code, which is deemed to be a part of every profession-specific act, profession-specific acts and regulations and bylaws, standards and guidelines. The code, the profession-specific acts and regulations include key provisions that allow colleges to regulate their professions. These include scopes of practice, authorized acts, protected titles, statutory committees, and all the processes that we use to regulate professions. The code has 12 objects that define the essential duties of colleges. The code also includes a requirement that when fulfilling their objects, colleges have a duty to act in the interest of the public. The Council's role is to provide organizational direction for a profession's college by establishing a mission, a vision, and by setting policy. Staff's role, including the role of the Registrar, is to manage the day-to-day -day activities of the college within the policies established by the Council. These activities are to be accomplished, always keeping in mind the obligation to act in the interest of the public. 
The RHPA gives the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care both the responsibility and the authority to ensure that colleges regulate professions in the interest of the public. History has demonstrated that the Minister will use his or her authority over colleges if they do not act in the best interests of the public. Acting as a council member that regulates a health profession is a significant responsibility as councillors have obligations to the public, the profession and the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. It's a duty that must be taken seriously. Thanks for taking the time to learn more about the Regulated Health Professions Act. We hope this video was informative. To access the Act, go to the Ontario eLaws website at elaws.gov.on.ca.